Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for organising the kind of mini uh, Hi, I'm Joel. I work on ARM BMCs, ARM computers um, for BMCs at IBM. Uh, most of my colleagues work on PowerPC, so I'm the odd one out. Uh, sorry? Uh, and, and so we're here today a little bit to talk about Clang built Linux um, and, and why I started playing around with it and where it's at. Next slide. So uh, I wrote a DRM driver for the BMC. BMCs are weird little things and they've got all kinds of bits and pieces. Come along to my talk tomorrow afternoon to hear about how that can go wrong. Um, and, and so in this case, we wrote this, this drive. It's pretty small, right? You know, 700 lines of code. Um, how, much, how much can that blow a, a kernel by? Uh, it turns out by about 7%. Um, when you've got a little ARM system, your kernel's a couple of megabytes, and you throw in the DRM stack, and, and that's lots of code. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Keith. Uh, <laughs> No. Uh, so, so, um, so what can we do about that is, is the question I asked. Um, is there a way to, to have a, a reduced minimal set? Um, I spoke on IRC, the, there's, someone's had plans to do that for a long time, no, one, no one's got around to doing it. And, and the suggestion was, can you try and get rid of some of the unused code using um, the dead code elimination feature the kernel has? So, so Nick Piggin added this thing back in 2016 um, called config LD dead code data elimination. Uh, commit messages look like this. And so on, in, under certain circumstances, the, the kernel can, uh, or the, the linker, can throw away parts of the code that, that aren't linked in. Um, and you can recover a little bit of your, your kernel size through, this kernel image size through enabling this. Uh, it wasn't enabled for ARM32, so I kind of hacked it in. Uh, it mostly involves sprinkling keeps all over the place so that uh, bits of the kernel that it can't work out are supposed to be linked to the image get left in there. Um, and, and then I, I, I booted my kernel and, and it saved about 1% of the code size. So, you know, not zero, but not enough to recover that 9% that I lost adding in Ethereum. Um, and so, the, yeah, this was a 30 bit ARM kernel uh, with no modules. So, so what else could we do? Um, the, yeah, how about Clang, essentially? So I've gone through these points already. So. Um, the, the Clang, the state of Linux kernel with Clang was, was uh, you know, intermittent. There was a project a little while ago uh, where some people uh, did, did a bunch of work to get the kernel bit of Clang, rolled in a bunch of out three patches, some code did go into the kernel, but you know, upstream wasn't building yet. Um, and I knew one of my colleagues had done a bunch of work trying to get PowerPC kernels to, to work. So Anton had, had done a few bits here and there to try and get PowerPC building with Clang. And, and so I went about asking, how does that work? And given my employer makes PowerPC chips, I thought, hey, why not, why not do some PowerPC kernel hacking for once? Um, and in, in my searching, I came across this GitHub project by, by Nick. Uh, Nick's a Googler. Uh, he got interested in using Clang and LLVM with the kernel. Um, for a bunch of reasons, he used to work at, at Mozilla and, and they were using Clang to build Firefox. Um, there's also a big push inside his company to, to use Clang for, for lots of things. And, and also the, the Android kernel team uh, had, had been looking at using Clang, or I think they, they shipped using Clang um, on their devices because of some of the security features that enabled, kind of calling back to, to Casey's talk earlier. Um, they have this thing called CFI, Control Flow Integrity, I think it's called, that um, tries to, to stop bad things happening in your kernel um, using compiler instrumentation instead of having to write more lines of code. Another thing that Clang did was, was link time optimization, hence, hence my interest, and seeing if maybe Clang could help me out there. The answer is no. Uh, Clang builds much, much larger kernels than GCC does. So it's not actually a solution to the problem, but, but it's, it's kind of, I want to provide the motivation for why I started hacking on this stuff. So to build Clang, as you would do a kernel with Clang, you, you set your CC to Clang and off it goes. Um, most of my day spent cross-compiling kernels because I'm either working on ARM or working on power. And it turns out that's pretty simple as well. Uh, Clang, unlike GCC, contains targets for all the possible supported uh, systems, uh, like architectures, I should say, inside the one binary. So you don't need to set a different or install a different cross-compiler as, as we do with GCC. You do need to, to set the cross-compile target and, and that internally the, the make files go and, and set the right thing so that you're targeting the right architecture um, inside the, the kernel build system. Normally, when we're building with Clang at the moment, we're building with the GNU linker, so the, the standard linker. 
Uh, there's a bit of work to get the Clang linker working as well. That's, that's a fair bit behind, just using Clang as a compiler. Um, I think for ARM64 it works, but for other architectures, not quite yet. Um, it almost works for PowerPC64 LE. Uh, we added a, a couple extra locations the other day, and so it's getting quite close there. So one of the challenges here is, is getting it going. Um, you can jump on your distro and yum install, or get install, or, or whatever package manager you're using, and you'll probably get Clang 7, which is the latest stable release, and it probably won't build your kernel. Um, almost definitely won't. So using Clang Master uh, is, is the way to go there, or Clang Trunk, because um, they use the version, is, is the way to go. Um, there's, there's app packages for that, which helps a little bit, but to go the extra step, um, some of the Clang built Linux guys have put together a Docker image, so you can grab the Docker image and build using the tools there. In the readme that I've got linked there, it can tell you, you, know, you perform a bunch of Docker tricks, so you can either use the tools and your source tree on your hard drive, or you can mount it inside the Docker volume, or, or, or do whatever. Um, the reason we created this was also so we could get CI up and running, continuous integration. So one of the challenges in, in getting or keeping Clang building the kernel is that most kernel developers don't use Clang and, and don't want to add you know, an extra whatever to their compile time. So we want to do some CI to keep it building without relying on everyone to do it individually. Um, and that's what this looks like. So it's using Travis. Who's here has used Travis before? About half the audience, cool. So Travis is handy in that for open source projects, it's free. Um, if you've got your project up on GitHub, it will automatically build when you push to it, and, and they will give you free compute. Uh, the, the gotchas is that they'll only give you 40 minutes of compile time, and depending on your kernel configuration, that might not be enough. Um, and especially if you're building all the modules in, in say, one of the, the, the bigger def configs in the kernel, that's not enough. So we don't test module builds with the continuous integration, and we do use um, Ccache pretty aggressively. Uh, there's some tricks that I learned about Ccache when doing this. Um, you can set a, a kbuild parameter that, um, and give it a date so that every time you build, it doesn't get a new date in the kernel. Really annoying if you're testing booting, but really good if you're trying to have a reproducible build where nothing's changed. Um, and so with Travis, it'll slurp up the Ccache directory and archive that every time I have to do a build. So we do some builds, it's quite quick. Um, a couple of minutes for a, for a completely cache build up to about 38 minutes, so the, the slowest one there you can see is the ARM64 build. Um, it's, it's got lots of code enabled in that dev config, so that takes, takes the longest. Now you can see here we've got a whole bunch of architectures going on. So initially Nick added ARM64 and S86, uh, I went in there and added PowerPC and ARM, and so we've got a 32-bit PowerPC machine, the LE64, which is what most of the distros, you know, your RELs and your Ubuntu's and whatever are shipping these days. Uh, BE's on its way. We've got a little QMU issue there to sort out. Um, and, and then a bunch of ARM configs, so the, the various different 32-bit ARM configs. I care about V5 and V6, that's what we use for the BMC. V7 is um, what most of the 32-bit Android devices are using, so, so that's why we care about that one. So we're not just building, uh, building the kernel with this, we're also booting it in QEMU. QEMU has pretty good support for booting all kinds of architectures in an emulator machine. Um, I, I boot the, the BMC machine for the V5 and the V6, so I get nice coverage of the kernel that I maintain, which is, which is handy. Um, the ARM64 one's a virtualized machine, the PowerPC one's a, PowerPC32 is a random embedded machine that the, the PowerPC440 maintainer I'm sure cares about. Where's Alistair? Um, and, and so what this does is it, it boots the kernel, it runs the kernel self-test that we can build into the kernel, and if it exits successfully, then, then yay, we're good. And we do this on master, on, on Linux's tree, and we also do it on Linux Next using Travis CI's cron job feature, which I didn't know existed. So it turns out Travis lets you define jobs that only run every X amount of time because Linux Next only comes out once a day, as long as Steven gets through all the batches. Um, there's no point doing it more than once a day, so uh, we, we do that there. And so that gives us pretty good coverage. We, we tend to pick up any regressions well before they happen. Um, there was some, one of the, the gotchas there is that the, 64, the uh, Intel 64-bit build 
recently started using ASM GoTo, and Clang doesn't support ASM GoTo. It's one of the big missing features that, that Clang doesn't have. Um, and so if you're on x86 and, and you're using a modern kernel, you won't be able to build Clang with that. The current CI reverts those patches, um, which is a, a bit of an unfortunate workaround. Um, and, but it does get it going, whereas all the other architectures there, I think, are, are building kind of um, the upstream tree. We've got all the patches in there. So what kind of fixes have gone upstream? Like, what, what's the point of doing all this Clang stuff? There's a lot of, of driver uh, warnings that show up in Clang that you won't see in GCC um, due to the, the way that the Clang front end looks through the code. It, it does highlight some, some different issues. And there's been some real bugs. Um, in, when I'm wearing another hat, I maintain the, the bootloader we use for the open power um, Linux's bootloader. And, and I, so I just see lots of hairy looking network card code and hairy looking RAID code that doesn't really make sense when you read it. And, and Clang called us out on that. Uh, there were some bugs in there. Turns out most of the bugs are related to, to which debug message would get printed. Uh, so pretty innocuous bugs, but bugs nonetheless. Um, so that, that's the majority of the patches that have gone in fixing Clang. There have also been a bunch of kind of enablement. So there's either features that aren't present in Clang that GCC has or ways that Clang builds the kernel that's not compatible with GCC's expectations. And so we've had to have workarounds on the tree for that. And I thought we'd just take a look at some of those patches. So um, this is a patch that uses, so we, we, we try to, where we can, have the, the options fail open so that when Clang does get around to supporting the flag, no code changes need to the kernel and, and we can take advantage of the feature. There's some areas where that doesn't happen and that's where we have this config CC is Clang and so we can guard certain things or add certain flags depending on what's going on. One of the hairier parts of getting Clang going was that for each of our architectures we have boot wrappers, so little independent programs that are usually compiled with different flags that wrap the kernel image and do some kind of decompression or relocation before you jump into the kernel proper. And, and for each of the architectures, we had to go through um, and get those building right, um, either because they were ignoring the flags that were setting the top-level make file, or um, they, were, they were doing tricks to, to substitute flags through that, that just didn't work in a generic way. So that's, that's one of the kind of things we had to do. Um, another one is the when the Clang guys implement support for an architecture, they make assumptions or guesses about how things should be. Um, in this case, they decided to uh, unconditionally reserve R2 for the PowerPC32 architecture, which um, is a downside if you want to use all of your general purpose registers. Um, but for the kernel, we, we want to set that aside anyway. So we would pass a fixed R2 flag for, to, to the GNU tools to do this. <laughs> With Clang, it doesn't support that flag because it's unconditionally doing it. So I had to do a little bit of archaeology to work out what was going on there, and, um, and now we could boot from 32-bit. Um, so as you can see there, we're, we're using the call CC option wrapper to, to protect against that so that when Clang does get around to supporting these flags, it will just use the feature. We won't have to go and revert this patch, although you know, that could be done as a cleanup. We don't need to. Um, there's this other, this is another fun one. Um, there's a, a bug in GMP's long, long.h that was fixed 17 years ago. And, no, sorry, that header was imported 17 years ago into GCC. And then 10 years ago, that was synced from GCC into the kernel. And about nine years ago in GCC, this issue was fixed. And, and no one synced it since. Um, so we got around to syncing it and it fixed the issue. Um, again, having to kind of dig through uh, people's memories and, and Linux history, Git trees, and things like this to work out what's going on. So it was all a bit of fun. Um, what other interesting ones? Before I keep going, we'll stop and have some questions maybe. Has anyone, anyone got any questions or comments or things we want to talk about? We've got a monitor here with a mic, so why, no, we've got one at the back. Oh, sorry, the monitor's in it. Hi, so my understanding is it takes longer to compile and it makes a bigger kernel. Is there any advantages to using Clang apart from the security? I don't think it takes longer, but um, it does result in a larger kernel image. 
are there any advantages? Uh, so the, there's the extra security features and the extra diagnostics. Uh, everyone wins from the extra diagnostics. You don't have to build your kernel with Clang because we've fixed these, these kind of warnings that came from Clang. So if you're building with GCC, you've in theory got improved code. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not here to evangelize Clang. You know, I, I don't plan on using it for the BMC products that we work on because it builds a bigger kernel. Um, I just wanted to make people aware of what was going on. There are lots of patches flying around on lists, on kernel lists. If you're a kernel developer, you would have seen these. So kind of raising some awareness as to where this came from and why it was happening. Hey, um, have you pushed on sort of why Clang generates larger kernels? Is that across <laughs> all architectures or just specific ones? Or? I've mostly looked at power. Um, and there's some, some things it does that are not as good as it could be. Um, I haven't pushed very hard on, on why it makes bigger kernels. No. It, yeah, some of the optimizations are strange. Sorry, I'll, I'll talk about it later with you. So you, you mentioned for x86 you revert certain patches. Can't you compile the specific file with uh, GCC? Can you mix Clang and GCC? Have you tried that? Um, or do you lose? I've not tried minutes? that. I think that might be interesting instead of having to revert patches. Yeah. I mean, for, for the architectures I care about, Power and x86, it, it just works. Um, as of 419, we're, we're in a pretty good state. So yeah, this is just the x86 stuff, which I've not built an x86 kernel in a while. Adam, welcome to New Zealand. Thanks, Joel. Um, do you have any sense of how likely it is that Clang's going to implement support for Asm Go to at some point, given that that's obviously suboptimal to be reverting existing patches? Yeah, there, there's there's proof of concepts on the list. It's been a kind of an ongoing project. Different people have like, oh yeah, I'm working on it. But um, one of the Google Clang engineers has posted another patch set recently, so I, I imagine they're really close. Again, I kind of haven't looked at that too much because it's not an architecture I'd work on. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you hit what L uh, Clang call heinous GNU extensions. Yeah, so this patch here that's on the screen, initially I sent a patch enabling hideous GNU extensions. Um, I, I can't profess to know the details of, of what weirdness this was doing, um, but enabling that flag worked around this. We decided to put the, the proper fix in place because that was the right thing to do. But yeah, um, this is in 4.20, I think. So have a look at, at the, yeah. What's the, the, the math emulation code? Uh, I would suggest that you just read the actual um, message. It, it says that you require an L value. Probably something was marked const where it shouldn't be. Yeah, I, I can't remember, sorry. Before Christmas. Have you tried to see if it makes a faster kernel with Clang compared to GCC? Um, it didn't, doesn't boot any slower, but yeah, I only boot it for boots, ship it. What's about the reason for this? Is it memory footprint or whatever? Uh, why did I get into it? Is that what your question is? Yes. Uh, what's the reason for this? Yeah, uh, is so it memory uh, footprint or? Originally I got into it because I was trying to reduce the binary size of the kernel in Flash for our embedded product I work on. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the code I assume would change. I assume the data would be pretty constant. No? Not in general, because uh, the compiler could uh, do better optimization or could uh, uh, ex exploit the registers uh, yep. in a better way or whatever, and stack a layout can have an influence and boundaries of um, caches and uh, cache lines and so on. Yeah. So it's a little bit more complicated picture. So it's it's just for getting experience with this. Uh, so th I think a memory footprint is the main uh, performance uh, in impact of. Uh, 
yeah, in my case, it was just purely flash size, so the, the, the combined binary size of the kernel image. But yeah, that, that's it. All right, last question. Going, going, gone. All right, thanks for listening, everyone.